Zoom. Um, and we will bring those up to Paula and Paige at the end and uh, hopefully they'll get a chance to answer all of your questions. Um, finally, I'm excited to introduce Paula Cooley and Paige Mortensen. Uh, they're here to talk to us tonight about their collaborative process in creating the installation piece entitled Solari. Uh, Solari is part of the Saskatchewan Craft Council's members exhibition from scratch. If you haven't yet viewed the exhibition, it's on view at the Saskatchewan Craft Council Gallery until November 6. So please join me in welcoming Paula and Paige. Thanks, Leah. Um, and welcome everyone who is uh, zooming in to join our virtual artist talk. Um, we're really quite excited to have this opportunity to talk about uh, Solari. And I also want to thank Maya and Leah for organizing this artist talk. Uh, in these COVID-19 times, we are all finding that we need to do things in new in different ways, including artist talks. And Paige and I really appreciate the help Maya and Leah have given us in putting this together and enabling us to share our conversation about our work. In the pre-COVID-19 times, we would have been in the Saskatchewan Craft Council Gallery up close and personal with the work. But now that the, that is not possible, Paige and I have put together a PowerPoint for you tonight to show how Solari began and how it has evolved and grown over the past two years. And fingers crossed, the technology gods will smile on us tonight and we will have no surprises. Solari began about two years ago when Paige and I started working together. Though at that time, which would have been fall 2018, we didn't have a specific project in mind. Paige and I shared a mutual interest in collaborating, creative curiosity, and a desire to see what might come from working with another artist who worked in a completely different media. Paige working two-dimensionally and myself working three-dimensionally. We were truly starting from scratch with no idea where our collaboration might lead us. So far, we are two years into this creative journey and we feel that Solari is not finished and is continuing to evolve. So we may have several, several more years ahead of us. Paige and I tonight are going to talk about where we started from and how we developed the work that is now, or at least a section of it, as you can see on your screen, uh, is at the Saskatchewan Craft Council Gallery. But before we get into the details about that collaboration, Paige and I thought it would be helpful to give some background on each of us and our practices. So we'll start off with me. So I am Paula Cooley, uh, living and working here in Saskatoon. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a ceramic artist and I was introduced to clay in the early 1990s when I took my first class with the Saskatoon Potters Guild. I was quickly captivated by the immediacy and the versatility of clay and so I went on to do my ceramicist diploma at SIAST in Prince Albert and followed that with my BFA at the University of Saskatchewan. I have two distinct parts to my ceramic practice in that I produced functional pottery such as what is seen here, bowls, plates and mugs and such, but I also make sculptural work. I'm always curious about what clay can and cannot do. So over the past 20 years, I've explored many different forming, decorating and firing techniques, as well as introducing different materials such as steel and glass into my sculptures. Specific interests guide my sculptural practice. 
I want to make forms that are animated, that look like they might move or grow or sway in the breeze. I enjoy working with multiples and investigating how separate pieces can come together to create one larger work. Negative space fascinates me. I think about the empty spaces between paired or multiple objects and how to make that empty or negative space an integral part of the piece. Light and shadow are important to me. Even though clay is an opaque, dense material, I'm intrigued with trying to find ways to have light move through my work. I consider the space around my sculptures, often using cast shadows to visually activate the area surrounding my work, drawing the viewer's eye out beyond the piece. So over the past 20 years, I've done much exploring, but at the same time, I realize I have so much more to learn. And for me, collaborating with another artist, such as Paige, provides a wonderful opportunity for some of this continued growth and challenge for me. And at this point, I'm gonna pass it over to Paige and she's gonna talk a little bit about her work. Thanks, Paula. And I'm Paige Mortensen. I'm a batik artist and I live in Saskatoon also. Early in life, my focus was on math and science. There were things to discover and clear answers to the questions. At the same time, crafts were plentiful, the kind with rules and patterns to follow. When I began painting as an adult, it was with folk art classes where once again, there were clear instructions and specific goals. However, I learned a lot about technique, color and composition. But soon following the patterns wasn't that satisfying and I knew I had to find the courage to let go of the rules and expectations. The University of Saskatchewan's Certificate in Art and Design program helped me with that by exposing me to a range of media and artists. Near the end of that program, I discovered a process called watercolor batik and I knew I had found my medium. The process is orderly and structured and at the same time uncontrollable. I can have a plan and then I have to let go so the wax and watercolor can do the work. Color charts have replaced spreadsheets, but the batik process keeps me grounded in science. The necessity of working from light to dark while building layers of wax and watercolor create the structure within which my creativity finds its voice. My focus is on texture, the roughness of wood in the old prairie buildings, the crunch of autumn leaves, the softness of moss growing on trees. I'm also fascinated by the watercolor batik process, from the texture of the ginwashi paper to the tactile nature of layering wax and watercolor. It is an intriguing mystery unfolding in front of me. While I continue to create the two-dimensional batiks, I also wanted to explore what else I could do with it. I wanted to add light and become more abstract. I also knew I wanted to figure out my why. Why do I create art? And what is the message I want the viewer to understand? And that is the beginning of our collaboration. So pull up a chair and come on the journey to the creation of Solari. Carfax Saskatchewan is a nonprofit organization that works to provide support to artists. One of their programs is a 10 month mentorship that brings artists together to work on our own artistic growth. Two years ago, Paula and I connected as part of this program. Early on in the mentorship, we decided we wanted to work collaboratively. We spent a lot of time talking about what that might look like and came up with a list of criteria that were important to us. We'd each been wanting to explore ways of working with light. So that was the piece that would pull the papers and ceramics together. Our goal was to be challenged and to take our work off the wall and off the pedestal, creating something neither one of us could have done without the other. We wanted to go big and create an immersive environment to which the viewers could respond emotionally. We decided to use the natural world as our inspiration and work in the abstract rather than trying to be realistic. 
shown here are our first collaborative pieces, which we called our drifting studies. At this point, we were interested in leaves floating on water. While we were happy with the way the pieces turned out, we felt this work was safe and didn't challenge us in new and creative ways. However, the drifting studies were a beneficial part of our collaborative process because in the making of these pieces, we were getting to know each other's aesthetics and learning how to work together on a shared piece. We identified that it was important that whatever work resulted, it had to combine both of our voices in equal parts. There would be no lead artist. Neither of us wanted to see the other as a fabricator, someone who builds a piece according to the other's vision or specification. We wanted any work we collaborated on to have a collective voice coming from a shared vision and dialogue. Continuing my desire to find my why and make my work with a purpose beyond a nice piece to hang on the wall, I took an abstraction class taught by a Saskatchewan abstract painter, Kim Annis. He believes that his role is to ask the questions the student is seeking to answer, offer up suggestions and invite collaboration. The question he asked that stood out the most for me was, what are you passionate about? He suggested we find something that was really important to us, each of us and then forget about it and see where your art takes you. Crunchy fall leaves were that thing. The rich fall colors, the crunching sound they make when you walk on them and their beautiful texture. This is when I started sewing these leaves using free motion stitching on dissolvable fabric. And now back to you, Paula. So Paige and I spent the first six or eight months talking about and exploring how we might work with light. And for both of us, light was a new and very different material. We found light elusive and a little bit puzzling. It wasn't something concrete that we could hold in our hands like a piece of clay or a sewn ring. And so there was much we needed to begin to start figuring out. We experimented with different directions of light, sources of light, intensities, colors, uh, and talked a lot about shadow and darkness. And you can see here, these are some of our our early kind of experiments trying to figure these questions out. We tried lots of things and many didn't work out the way we thought they might. However, these experiments or these sketches gave us valuable information about what to try differently and how to move our, our, our ideas forward. So even each so-called failure was important and we wouldn't be where we are now without those early failures. One of our initial ideas was to place lights inside ceramic uh, frames or rings that had layered batik papers on top of them in order to suggest the depths of a lake or another body of water. That then took us to thinking about leaves floating on the water. And that brought us to this idea of a river installation. We talked about and mocked up a collection of small ceramic basins, and you can see them here on your screen, uh, with the idea that they would be shallow at first and then gradually deepen as if suggesting a river or stream moving away from the viewer. This then led us to crucial questions about the who, what, where, and why of the feeling we wanted to create. These questions and the discussions that resulted from these questions helped us realize that we wanted to create a contemplative, a serene and meditative space that would provide the opportunity for the viewer to get away from the busyness of life allow the viewer some time to regroup and just breathe. So now the work would no longer suggest a lake or a river,
but rather an autumn day in the forest where you are standing and enjoying the beauty of nature. We wanted to bring this experience of nature into an urban gallery setting and invite the viewer to get lost in the details of the changing patterns, colors, and light of the natural world. You can see in these two images here, the dramatic changes that were brought about by different lighting. The image on the left is just lit uh, from above, whereas the image on the right has an interior light. As I mentioned earlier, many hours were spent thinking and exploring different light sources, intensities, and colors. We played around with red light, with blue light, green light, and yellow lights, but ended up um, in the end staying with, uh, with white lights. At the same time, other ideas were beginning to emerge, sometimes at very unexpected times. Paige remembers uh, having a collection of rings similar to what you see here on the screen, sitting on her table in the studio for days, and then Suddenly she thought, what if I tip some of these rings? Just changing this orientation immediately changed the work in a new way and made us realize that our collaboration was really a three-way conversation between Paige, myself, and the existing work. From then on, if we felt a component wasn't quite working the way we wanted, we would try something different, sit with it, for however long it took, and inevitably a new idea would emerge. So early in the collaboration, we were placing uh, Paige's papers, her batik papers, on top of my ceramic forms. And, and we came to call these ceramic forms rings. So you'll hear me refer to them as rings through part of this presentation. And then we changed the name. So you'll hear them identified differently soon. So as you can see in this image, the clay rings started off with very straight horizontal edges in order to support Paige's papers. And from here, we began experimenting with different versions of the clay rings, as well as different colors and textures of paper, trying to get a work that felt less structured and more organic. In these images, you can see some of the experiments we tried with different variations of the papers and the rings. One of the questions we were asking ourselves early on was how to attach the papers to the ceramic rings. We tried glue, but we also tried a version, as you can see here on the left of your screen, with small openings in the side of the ceramic rings so we could sew the papers on top. We also explored making a more literal tree pattern by gluing multiple layers of paper to the top of the ring. And you can see that variation in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. This is one of these ideas where we thought it would be interesting, we mocked it up, we decided it wasn't interesting, and so on we moved to something different. We did, however, come to realize that the tops of the rings did not need to be level to support the papers. So I began cutting them on an angle and moving towards making uh, more undulating tops. As you've probably gathered from what we've talked about so far, nature is a primary source of inspiration for both Paige and myself. And uh, the picture image on your top left-hand corner is a photo of a decaying tree trunk that Paige took while she was hiking in the Maritimes. And that photo started us off in a new direction for the ceramic rings. Once we'd made the decision that the rings didn't need to be round or flat to support the papers, we started exploring different forms and textures that would suggest decomposing 
wood. I began adding more layers of clay texture to both the inside and outside of the forms that we now started calling stumps. And you can see a couple of variations on the screen of those, uh, those clay stumps. And we had now moved from static ceramic rings for the papers to rest on to organic ceramic forms that ultimately would rest on top of the papers. So in the early stages of Solari, we placed the lights just inside the ceramic rings so that they would be shining up through the papers on top of them. Then the question became, became what do we put underneath these lit rings? And in this image, you can see we experimented with various materials and textures, um, including here several different images, uh, several different fabrics. And from here, we came to realize that the best way to light the work was not by placing lights inside the stumps, but in lighting the entire piece from underneath. And so we got rid of that idea of putting lights inside the stumps. We found that Page's batik papers were a really wonderful way to filter the light and created some lovely areas of, of light and shadow. So we took over part of Page's basement and mocked up a basic light table, a pedestal, uh, using an old glass door, as you can see on the right-hand side, and four LED lights clamped from underneath. So this is another picture of that mocked up piece from the, that's in our basement. Um, but using that same door as the pedestal, we created the first version of Solari. And we were able to show this at the Carfac Mentorship Group Exhibition in the spring, summer of 2019, which was held in the Snell Grove Gallery on campus. And here's a picture of it in the gallery space. This exhibition allowed us to see Solari in a gallery space for the first time. Getting it out of my crowded basement into a dedicated space gave us a different perspective, as well as the opportunity to talk with others about the piece. Those conversations added another collaborative dimension. Now, Solari was speaking to the audience and those people in turn were sharing their experiences of the work with us. The conversations that had begun between the two of us had broadened to include many people. Conversations about Solari with others have been and continue to be important to us and our process. We appreciated the feedback we received in the summer of 2019 from our fellow participants in the mentorship program, as well as others, such as Martha Cole, who's an award-winning Saskatchewan artist most known for her fiber work, and she has a deep connection to the land. From Kim Annis, who I mentioned earlier, from Vivian Orr from the Saskatchewan Craft Council, and then from Sarah Kirsik, who is an assistant professor at the University of Manitoba in the School of Art. And she was also the 2019 visit and men visiting mentor for another Carfax program that we were fortunate enough to be able to participate in. Their feedback strengthened our desire to develop this project even further. <laughs> so even though the mentorship program had formally ended, we realized that Solari was going to lead us forward down another path. So in the fall of 2019, we had the opportunity to show Solari at the Unitarian Center in Saskatoon as part of their Thanksgiving celebrations. During the service, everyone was invited to spend some time with Solari and then write their response on a leaf and add it to the display. In the words of Liz James, who was led the service that day, together we will create something that doesn't quite make sense, art built on art, each leaf pointing to a powerful story that sits in this room. Together, we will make something that we can share, but not fully understand. Something we feel, 
but don't have words for. This was another powerful moment in our journey as we began to think about how we could make Solari into an interact interactive experience by encouraging audience participation. Showing Solari at the Snell Grove Gallery and then again at the Unitarian Center uh, strengthened Paige and my interest in continuing to refine the work. So the six months from August 2019 to January 2020 were a substantial period of, of growth for us. We changed Solari in many ways, though our vision of using light, batik papers, ceramic stumps, and sewn thread leaves to create a meditative experience for the viewer remained a constant. One of the major changes we made was to the light base table, replacing the rectangular top made from an old door, as you can see on the top image, to in the bottom image, an organic shape base made from rigid cardboard. We also abandoned the idea of having the batik papers being attached to the top of the ceramic rings instead opting to leave the rings, now stumps, as you can see in the bottom right hand corner, hollow with perhaps some stones or leaves scattered inside. We decided to create a single Solari segment that we could document and use to apply for other exhibitions and grants. Ultimately, we wanted to create and develop a Solari that was a room-sized installation with approximately a dozen related components that would come together to suggest a path through the forest. We began thinking about lights and plexiglass and figuring out how to create a low budget light table that could be easily transported and stored. So this is the segment we created early in 2020 for purposes of exhibition and grant proposals. And just want to draw your attention to how different the work looks depending on the room lighting. So the top image is uh, solar, the Solari segment lit just with uh, from above with typical room lighting. And the image on the bottom is Solari in a dim room with the interior light from the light base. So Paige and I want Solari to reward the viewer who takes the time to look closely at the work, much like a walker who slows down in the forest and looks at the ground at their feet. As these images here show, Solari has many rich details to enjoy. There are small spaces of jewel-like colors with differing degrees of light and shadow, there are lush textured areas on the stumps. There are small stones and wispy thread leaves. Last fall, we, Paige and I accepted an invitation to exhibit Solari at the Contemplative Arts Festival in Saskatoon, which was scheduled for May, 2020. This was a wonderful opportunity for us to present Solari as an installation for the very first time, creating an environment for the viewer to experience. We plan to install Solari in a room, filling the space with about seven segments of varying sizes laid out to suggest a meandering forest path. We cut out the basic shapes, laid them out in Paige's basement once again, as you can see on the image on the left-hand side, and then took them to Grosvenor Park Church where the festival would be held. And that's the image on your bottom right-hand side. Unfortunately, the church had been recently flooded. So the flooring was out and it wasn't the ideal situation, 
but it was still really exciting for Paige and I to see this work finally coming together as an installation. Paige and I were also eager to try out two new ideas with this version of Solari. Before COVID-19 hit and ended plans for the Contemplative Festival of the Arts, Paige and I were collaborating or beginning to collaborate with a sound artist to create a sound loop that would complement our concept of a walk through an autumn forest. We also wanted to build in an interactive component to Solari, providing stones and leaves that the viewers could write a thought or message on and then add to Solari. We were really excited to have the audience collaborate with us in this way, adding one more layer of rich detail to Solari. We were also looking forward to talking to viewers and hearing their responses to Solari, since conversations such as these have over the past two years helped us grow and evolve Solari. Unfortunately, all these plans for Solari have been disrupted by COVID-19 and the project currently is in limbo. So looking back over the last two years and reflecting on what has worked for us in our collaboration, a few things stand out as helping us set the stage for our journey. Most importantly is the mutual respect for each other's artistic skills and knowledge. We have approached this as equals and worked hard to ensure the results are recognizable as each of our work and yet different as we bring our styles together. The other critical piece is recognizing that the collaborative process takes time. Our hours of dialogue and conversations about details, ideas, concepts, and perspectives have been valuable both for the development of First Solari and for our individual practices. As we have mentioned, the collaboration goes beyond the two of us. There were many times when it seemed as though Solari was leading us and each person we talked to about Solari has added something to it, a memory, a reaction, an idea. These are some detail images from the current installation that is now part of the From Scratch exhibition at the Saskatchewan Craft Council. We are grateful for the opportunity to show it here. The larger project may be stalled due to the pandemic, but ideas are still percolating. Having this exhibition will provide incentive for expanding it into the future. Although we haven't been able to physically gather in the same space today, we would really appreciate your feedback and comments. There are a number of options for this to happen. First, if you're watching this live, you can type your question or comment in the chat and Leah and Maya will facilitate discussion. Secondly, please take the time to sign the virtual guest book provided by the Craft Council. You can access it from their website under the current exhibition, which is called From Scratch. And we are always happy to connect individually, so please do contact us directly if you have something to share. So thanks for joining us either live this evening or by watching this recording. And I'll turn it back to Leah and Maya to facilitate discussion. Thank you both of you for um, sharing all of those details with us. Um, we're gonna move on to the question and answer portion of our evening. Um, so I will start with a few questions that were submitted um, with registration. Um, the first question, um, what did you learn to take forward in your art practice through the past two years of working on Solari? Uh, do you want me to start off, Paige, or do you want sure. to? Sure, go ahead. Doesn't okay. matter. Go ahead. Okay. I have my own answer. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, as I understand it, it's uh, what did I, what have I learned from Paige over these past two years? And um, I guess what I would say 
I've learned lots, but one of the things that has come through for me is taking a more, more structured, a more formal approach to, to the ideas uh, behind Solari and then in consequence behind my own work. So one of the lovely things about collaborating with another artist is being able to see their creative process in action over a period of time and see how they, they make decisions about their work. So Paige, when we started our collaboration was very focused on the why of work. Why are we making this and how and what is it communicating? So, one of our initial meetings early on for uh, Twyla Tharp's book, which is called The Creative Habit, Learn It and Use It for Life. And Paige suggested that we do an exercise from that book uh, where we ask ourselves 20 questions about the work we were thinking of making. So there were questions such as, um, uh, what season is it? Uh, what's the weather? Are you looking up at whatever you're making or down or across? So there were a number of different questions working out the details of what we were thinking of making. So Paige uh, wrote down all our answers and this really helped us at that time to develop a shared focus of the work. Um, and whenever we got stuck, and we did get stuck over the past two years making things, whenever we got really stuck, we'd go back to those descriptors that Paige had written down. And that really helped us focus back on to what our initial vision, vision was and how to proceed from there. So having said all that, um, myself, my, my art practice is much more intuitive. So I start with an idea, sometimes just a form. I build on, I build something, uh, see what works, what doesn't work. And that in turn informs the next step. And then I make something else and so it goes. So working through an idea for me is a really fluid process. And I have to say, when I begin, I rarely know what uh, the end piece is going to look like. I don't know those details. I trust the process and hope that something interesting is going to, going to evolve. And so while I continue to work like this, I have also found and have learned from Paige to take a more methodical approach to refining my ideas. So when I get stuck on where to go next with a piece, and that happens frequently, I take, my, take the time to ask myself questions about my ideas and my intent for the piece, and then I write them down. So I'm not following Twyla Tharp, Tharp's book, and I'm not following her 20 questions, but I am asking myself who, what, where, when, and why, and I'm asking those questions on a regular basis and writing them down so that I can refer back to them. So Paige, thank you for adding that to my art practice. And I'm gonna turn it over to you. So, okay, well, my first thought was that Paula taught me to not think of everything I do or anything I do really as being precious, to just relax. <laughs> and let go of any end goal and see what comes. Bring my beginner's mind. When we walked into her studio and she uh, brings out her clay and she says, let's sketch. And I never considered sketching in anything other than a pen or a pencil. So um, just learning to like Paula said, trust the process and uh, see what comes and not not worry about it being precious. And uh, so in my case, it's only a piece of paper usually. So it's not that big of investment other than the learning process. So I've learned to let go. Okay. 
Thank you, both of you, for answering. Um, now we're going to flip that around a little bit and ask, um, what's the most challenging issue in collaborating with other artists? Okay. I was, uh, do you want to go first, Paige? Or? OK. Um, collaboration takes time, a lot of time. Um, so patience is, is important. Um, we, there's a lot more experimenting, I think, that needs to happen because there's two people involved and, and then there's this, whatever it is you're making, in our case, Solari, that we didn't know was going to be Solari. And I think listening to what we're seeing, I mean, <laughs> you're seeing it, but listening to what it's trying to tell us was really important and just learning to observe from two different people's perspectives was a big step. Um, I think most importantly was our mutual respect. Um, that wasn't ever an issue for us. We were always both open, I think, to um, whatever the other person had to say or share and what their reaction to where we were at was, um, but that continual mutual respect was really critical to the collaboration and will continue to be. Um, so yeah, what's the most challenging issue of collaboration with another artist? And if you're hoping for some drama, I'm sorry to disappoint here. Um, I, for me, um, and this is based on my own experience and, and my own personality, so other artists might answer differently. But for me, the most challenging issue of collaboration is what Paige said, is the amount of time collaboration takes. It is, it is a lengthy process. And I would say that it takes at least twice as long to make something um, as it would if I was working on my own. So ideas have to be discussed between two people. Decisions have to be made between two people. Often we decided to try a new material or new technique and very seldom did they work out well the very first time. So we would go back to the drawing board again and more discussion, more decisions. Um, having collaborating with another artist or several other artists means that there are two different lives and there are two different schedules. Uh, and the collaborative process is rarely straightforward. And I'd say while it's really rich and energizing, um, it also takes a lot of time and for me, uh, one of the things I had to constantly remind myself was to adjust my expectations around how long it would take to make something. And learning to be patient and give the process the necessary time it needs. And as we've referred to, this process started two years ago and I think I speak for both Paige and I is that we, at this point, two years in, don't feel it is done. And uh, I don't know, Paige, maybe another two years from now, we might have something maybe. different to say. <laughs> That's right. Uh, I would just like to share a comment that was left in our group chat because I don't think that Paula and Paige are monitoring it right now. Um, I'm just gonna read uh, word for word because I think it's really beautifully written. Um, I see interesting parallels to the writing process with the interplay between intuition, trusting the process and stopping to ask questions about the what and why, et cetera, when you're stuck. Do either of you have thoughts on that comment? Um, yes. Um, Thank you, Leona, for that 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 comment. Um, Leona is uh, is a writer, and uh, I think uh, 
our creative, the creative process that she undergoes and that Paige and I are working with are very similar. It's just our materials are different. We're, we're working with paper or we're working with thread or we're working with clay and the writer is working with words. But I would say the process is the same or very similar and uh, just different materials. Paige, do you have anything you want to add to that? I think, yeah, you've said it. it it's, there's the people and then there's the object or the words or the materials and they have a voice too. And we have to listen and watch for the voice that is coming from outside us somewhere. Thank you for the comment. Um, I just had one more question. Um, when Paula was talking about embracing failure as part of the creative process, um, I'm wondering if you want to expand on that idea beyond this project and how it relates to um, your personal practices in general, yours included, Paige. Oh, okay. Um, I would say I work, and I mentioned this earlier, I work quite intuitively. So I start off with an idea um, and try it out and it usually fails. Um, and I go into that process knowing that those first couple steps are going to be what I would call failures. Um, somebody I saw posted something a while ago that defined fail, F-A-I-L, as first attempt in learning. So when I get really down, I just remind myself that the piece that I have just thrown out because it didn't work is a first attempt in learning. Um, so I have found for me that there are many uh, so-called failures, but each one in a way helps inform the next step. So part of this also comes back to just giving yourself time to fail, so to speak, and knowing that those steps are an essential part of the process and just trying not to get too down on yourself um, when something doesn't quite work out. It's, it's that it's that um, concept that I learned from Paula <laughs> um, of not feeling like it's precious, like just starting off and doing something and seeing where it goes. And when it comes to its natural conclusion and maybe isn't what you expected, you backtrack a couple steps and try something different. And I find it quite rewarding I, because if everything just works it's not going to be very creative or very um, satisfying so it, it is rewarding to say oh I got this for and that worked but that didn't work and let's back up and try again I'm enjoying that process Leah does that kind of answer what uh, answer your question for you yeah that's a great answer um, I think it's really encouraging to share those things with other artists. Um, because I think that we forget that failure is such an important part of the process. Um, and it's not always a bad thing. Um, so that just kind of resonated with me. So thank you. Um, we are just about out of time. Um, we do have one more question from Kathleen. Um, she says, in seeing the PowerPoint with shots of the small pieces of Solari, which are each so beautiful, I wonder if Solari is one unit or beautiful stepping stones in nature. Kathleen is, is also an artist. Um, Solari has been in our minds many different things over time and this installation of Solari is kind of one we view it as one segment of what we would like to see as a multiple segment 
path in a forest, in a, in a gallery space probably, but um, each little piece is significant and then the segment is significant and then expanding it for sure. We'd like to see it grow and be something larger. Paula? Yeah. Um, Paige and I have talked a lot about what we'd like to see Solari be. And we really, I mean, if, if we could, we'd fill the whole Saskatchewan Craft Council gallery with uh, segments that would suggest a, a forest floor. Um, but uh, we can't do that at this point in time. So this is just one section to give the suggestion of uh, one stepping stone and at some point in time, hopefully there'll be many stepping stones through um, a gallery space. I hope so. <laughs> um, we are just about out of time here, um, but if anyone has any additional comments or questions, um, take a few moments to just put that in the chat and we'll make sure that that gets to Paula and Paige. Um, we also encourage you to have a visit to the Saskatchewan Craft Council website. Um, you can view the entire exhibition online there and you can also sign our virtual guest book. And if you leave a comment there, we will also be passing those along to Paula and Paige. Um, and if you haven't had a chance to see the exhibition, I definitely recommend getting in to see it in person if you can. Um, and just a reminder that it's on view until November 6th. The gallery is open from 12 till 5, Monday through Saturday. Uh, and if you would like to book a private viewing, you can do that by contacting the gallery. Um, and we offer private viewings Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday mornings. Um, and with that, uh, I would just like to thank everyone for joining us. Um, so we've got a really beautiful chat going on right now that hopefully people will continue. Uh, oh, I'm trying to keep up here. Someone would like to know if you have considered varying the light along with your soundscape. Seems like you could almost change seasons by changing light and sound. And that has been one of the ideas that, that we have talked about, um, about having light that changes throughout, throughout the day, so to speak, or through, um, throughout an hour or two, just to suggest the, the passage of time. Um, and we've also, uh, one of the other variations we've talked about is uh, instead of doing Solari as a autumn scene, we have talked about doing it as a winter scene. So stay tuned, maybe at some point in time, there might be a winter Solari. So yeah, lots of interesting options out there for us to explore. And, and we appreciate the suggestions that people are giving us now. Thank you. Okay, so we do need to wrap up here. Um, huge thank you to Paula and Paige for all of the work that you put into preparing for this um, and all of the thoughtful comments from everyone who was able to join us. Uh, we'll be sure to pass those along. Paula and Paige would love to hear your feedback. Um, and please come down to the gallery if you get a chance. Um, it is a really beautiful piece and seeing it in person is so different from seeing it in photographs. Um, so I hope everyone enjoyed their evening and um, hopefully you'll hear or be able to join us for um, our continued artist talk series with um, Talking Craft. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. Yes, thanks. Good night. Bye now. Thank you very much, Paula Page. Well done. Thank, Thank you, you, Craft Council Gallery, Leah and Maya. You guys are amazing. Thank you. Thanks, Christine.